My name is Drew Lansdowne. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at UCSF, and I specialize in sports medicine, um, the knee and the shoulder primarily. And uh, my topic tonight will be um, overuse injuries and in cycling, how, why, treatment, and prevention. Um, so just to begin, no relevant financial disclosures, um, a few from training that are listed here. But um, I think obviously everyone in this room understands, but uh, we live in a great city, a great area for cycling. Um, this is a huge part of the culture here. Um, the SFMTA estimates 128,000 trips made by bicycle daily, and 16% of the residents here identify as frequent cyclists. Um, it's hard not to get involved with the beautiful terrain, um, road biking, mountain biking, um, a great way to get to work. But um, unfortunately, injuries are common. Um, it's uncommon to be uh, blindsided by a kangaroo, but we do see a number of clavicle fractures, a number of traumatic injuries. Um, but then today, what we'll really be talking about is overuse injuries. So um, what I'd like to do in this talk is first start with um, an overview of overuse injury patterns for both professional and recreational cyclists. Um, get into the factors that contribute to these overuse injuries, and then discuss the etiology, treatment, and prevention of um, specific common overuse injuries. Um, so to begin, um, what is overuse? So um, essentially it's tissue damage from repetitive submaximal loading. And what happens is uh, you have this repetitive loading and inadequate recovery time um, for that microtrauma to either the bone, the joint, uh, the soft tissue. In the top slide have a um, histology representation of the changes seen in uh, tendon uh, with overuse with disorganized collagen in the upper um, part of the slide and then normal um, nice structure of collagen in the lower part. Uh, the video is just showing an arthroscopic image of cartilage uh, looking at that um, in the knee um, specifically in the patellofemoral compartment, which we'll um, talk more about as we go on here. Um, and cycling is repetitive. Um, professional cyclists, uh, it's been estimated they um, ride 25,000 to 35,000 kilometers per year. Uh, recreational cyclists, the number's probably somewhere over 7,000 kilometers a year. And every hour of cycling, you're uh, doing approximately 5,000 pedal revolutions. So uh, when we're talking about tissue damage from repetitive loading, um, cycling sets you up for that pretty well. Uh, so um, one study looking at the epidemiology of overuse injuries um, was by Clarson. Um, this was in a population of elite professional cyclists, road cyclists specifically. And um, in this group of 109 um, cyclists, uh, they registered 94 total injuries, um, overuse injuries over a one-year period. Um, and in this group, um, the location... Uh, so you can see the lower back, the pelvis, and the sacrum. Uh, this was reported as 43 of the injuries. Uh, the knee, um, 22. So the lower back and the knee predominated with um, the uh, types of injuries that they were reporting. Uh, they also reported um, how much time these riders missed due to the injuries, and the knee was the most significant for uh, more prolonged absence. So uh, low back and knee injuries in this professional cycling group are the most common, uh, and then knee injuries are really the most, um, most frequently responsible for the most time missed. Um, they also looked at the prevalence of back pain across the cycling season, and that was fairly steady. So this first is uh, the off-season, then you go pre-season, early season, and peak season, and um, the prevalence of back pain didn't change that much. So people are experiencing it, they seem to be cycling through it, but it's just there throughout. Uh, knee pain, however, was most common at the beginning of the year. So uh, it's not very prevalent in the off-season, get back training again, uh, the knee overuse injuries uh, declare themselves, and then taper off during the season. So that's uh, probably thought to be due to initial strength and coordination um, not showing up as much later in the year. Um, a separate study looked at, uh, more specifically, recreational cyclists. And this study um, included 518 recreational cyclists, and 85% of this group reported at least one non-traumatic injury over a one-year time period. So quite a um, large number of injuries. In uh, this group, the, that breakdown is slightly different. So we still see the knee and the thoracolumbar spine, the lower back, showing up. 42% uh, for the knee, 30% for the lower back. Uh, but then also a high percentage of cervical spine injuries. Uh, the severity, so 31% of these injuries required medical treatment. 11% um, had to miss time cycling, um, a mean of um, just over a month. And then almost 3% quit cycling because of these injuries. So um, I think in both the professional and the recreational populations, uh, these overuse injuries are a problem. They are something that we um, see frequently, unfortunately, and uh, need to have strategies to uh, deal with them. 
So then um, I think just trying to summarize all the factors that can contribute to overuse injury. Uh, one um, is bicycle fit, and um, I think uh, more um, avid cyclers understand the importance of having a, an appropriately fit bicycle. Uh, there are multiple variables that go into this. We'll touch on a few of them, uh, but this is certainly something that contributes. Um, another is the cyclist's anatomy. Uh, so there are uh, certain anatomic variants that will set you up for um, probably a higher prevalence of overuse injuries, and you may need to alter certain things based on um, those factors. And then finally, um, I think training factors. Um, the strength, the flexibility, um, the, the cadence, the resistance, how um, you are with inclines, and then the recovery time allowed. Um, and so these three large groups, I think, uh, contribute largely to um, the development and persistence of overuse injuries. Um, so just uh, briefly, um, the fit of the bicycle um, is very important. Um, a few parts of the bike that can be uh, varied and then um, we'll uh, talk about as we go on that um, impact uh, either overcoming overuse injuries or even preventing them. Um, so one is the seat height. Um, and uh, the seat height can be varied, um, influences knee and hip load, as well as oxygen consumption. Um, the seat position, um, that can influence the tibial alignment over the feet, which we can see uh, changes the load uh, seen across the knee joint. The handlebar height and the reach of the handlebars. Um, with a lower height, uh, you get greater aerodynamics, uh, but then you're assuming a more uh, flexed position, increased hyperextension of the neck, possibly setting yourself up for more uh, injuries at uh, the, the back and the neck. Um, then the crank length, um, a longer crank, greater mechanical advantage, um, but that comes at the expense of more hip and knee range of motion. So uh, many of these you're trading um, uh, one benefit for um, another and then possibly placing yourself at risk with um, certain injury patterns. Um, so I think uh, one of the um, variables that has been reported more in the uh, medical scientific literature is uh, the seat height. And um, have this slide in the next just to talk about a few of the different methods. Um, so these first four listed here are based on just anthropometric measurements. So um, all four uh, based on uh, measurement of some part of the lower limb and then uh, taking a percentage of that, setting the height accordingly. Um, so the first one reported in the 70s was uh, the Hamley and Thomas method. Um, the, uh, the height uh, set at 109% of the inseam measurement. Uh, so that's this uh, first line that they're showing here um, at C. And um, they actually showed that this produced a longer time to exhaustion. Um, so beneficial for cyclists. Uh, the trochanteric length, um, so you're looking at 100% of the length from the greater trochanter, which is the prominence that you can feel um, on the side of your hip. Um, and all the way down to the floor. And then uh, studies have shown that um, cycling economy is actually better at 96 to 100% versus 104. So um, at or below that trochanteric length versus slightly above, um, actually better um, cycling economy. Uh, and then the ischial tuberosity, this last one, um, it's 113%. Um, it's been reported in um, various studies also. And then uh, the LeMond method, um, Greg LeMond set his height according to 88.3% uh, of the distance from the top of the saddle to the center of the bottom bracket. Um, this gained a lot of interest due to his success and then um, has um, developed as a common way to potentially set uh, the bicycle seat height. Uh, but all of these, um, they assume the same proportions of the the femur and the tibia, the upper and lower um, parts of the lower extremity. Um, and so there may be some variability in the individual rider. Um, these next three are based more on uh, the knee flexion angle. And um, the first one is just uh, simply called the heel method. Um, when seated on the saddle, the knee's fully straight with the heel on the pedal. Uh, that's what we see here in this top picture. Um, Holmes. Um, described a few variations in the knee flexion angle, um, setting this with the foot at, um, on the pedal at six o'clock and set to 25 to 30 degrees. Um, and increasing that, decreasing that based on uh, the condition of the knee. And that uh, 25 degrees um, actually had a lower oxygen consumption um, compared to 35 degrees or that 109% of the inseam measurement. And then um, Howard um, advocated for a 30 degree uh, with a neutral foot um, with the pedal at six o'clock. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to set the seat. Um, I think as we go forward, we'll talk more about adjustments from where you are based on the injury pattern. But uh, I think if 
picking one specifically, um, I'd probably start with uh, the Holmes method um, that seems to have um, good data support it. But um, again, these aren't that well validated in the literature, so I don't think there's um, enough evidence to say one is clearly superior to another. Um, in the next um, set of slides, I uh, would like to just go through a few common overuse injury patterns. Uh, we'll start with the knee, um, progress to the hip, down to the foot and ankle, then the back, neck and shoulder, the wrist and hand. Um, and for the knee and the back specifically, I've um, tried to include a few more um, medical scientific studies. Um, there aren't a lot out there, so try to highlight where we do have some evidence and um, can provide some good recommendations. So um, to begin at the knee, probably the most common overuse um, issue is usually patellofemoral syndrome. Um, so uh, in one study looking at uh, riders during a recreational event, um, this was cited um, at um, more than 50% uh, for the cause of knee pain. Uh, and as we saw in both um, professional and recreational riders, uh, knee pain is a large, um, a large problem. So uh, the patellofemoral joint is uh, the articulation uh, between the patella, the kneecap, and uh, the trochlea, the groove on the femur. Um, and there's the cartilaginous surface on the undersurface of the patella and on the trochlea, and the patella can glide um, and connects the quadriceps um, to the tibia uh, through the patellar tendon uh, distal to it and the quadriceps tendon just above. Um, and patellofemoral syndrome uh, presents as pain behind the patella either during or after activity. And uh, this is uh, thought to be due to either increased pressure across the patellofemoral joint, um, which occurs in uh, deep reflection, deeper resisted loads, um, as well as from patellar maltracking. So um, bony alignment is an important factor in contributing to patellofemoral syndrome. Um, so if you imagine somebody with either knock knee, um, bow legs, um, that can change the uh, position of the uh, patella on the distal femur. Uh, clinically, a simple measurement we use is called the Q angle, uh, which is just the quadriceps angle. And um, I've just drawn that on this x-ray, but um, we're just it, evaluating a, a patient in the office. Uh, look at the anterior superior iliac spine, um, and that line to the center of the patella and then uh, to the tibial tubercle, that point where the patellar tendon inserts on the top of the tibia. Um, and as you can imagine, as this angle moves um, where it's um, a larger angle, uh, you have more of a lateral force vector. Uh, so every time that quadriceps is contracting, you're also adding that additional lateral pull to the patella. So this is a, a patient with, um, we would describe this as valgus knee alignment, where the knees are pointing inwards, like a knock knee, and uh, there's going to be increased lateral pull on the patella, um, and so you have that lateral maltracking and overload of the kneecap, right, more prone to having um, pain. Um, so uh, a few factors can also contribute to this um, malalignment of the patella. Um, so if that um, attachment on the tibia is um, further towards the outside, more lateral, uh, will also contribute. Um, if the tibias externally rotate, it does the same thing where it's more laterally positioned, have a greater force pulling it uh, towards the outside. Uh, the foot and pronation, uh, similar uh, finding. And then uh, the femoral um, the antiversion is just the alignment of the femoral neck at the top. And what that does is essentially internally rotates the femur. Uh, so you're, getting, you're moving that trochlea more medial and then increasing that force vector, pulling the patella uh, towards the outside. Uh, there's a number of other um, soft tissue um, cyclist factors that can contribute to patellofemoral syndrome. Uh, so this diagram uh, just shows the anatomy of the distal knee. Uh, so again, we have the patella here in the center, the patellar tendon, and the quadriceps tendon. And quadriceps gets its name because it's comprised of four muscles. Um, and on the outside, the vastus lateralis, and on the inside, uh, the vastus medialis obliquus, the VMO, which is um, one of the more important muscles with um, those repetitive um, cycling motions. Um, so patellofemoral pain uh, may be due to lateral tracking of the patella. Um, it can also be due to weakness or dysplasia of this um, VMO, the vastus medialis obliquus. Um, additionally, if uh, the hamstrings, um, the antagonist muscle posteriorly, if those are tight, uh, that can contribute to patellofemoral pain. Um, this study, uh, Erickson looked at uh, patellofemoral joint forces during ergometric cycling. Um, and um, this was in a group of six healthy men. And um, can see um, these are compressive loads across the, the quadriceps and patellar tendons, and then uh, compressive loads across the patellofemoral joint. 
And uh, those compressive loads can be decreased by a reduction in workload, uh, so lower resistance, um, as well as an increase in the saddle height. Um, so um, a lower saddle can increase those compressive forces across the patellofemoral joint. I think an important takeaway from this study. Um, in this study, um, Dieter uh, looked at muscle activation patterns um, and patellofemoral pain in cyclists. Um, they looked at 10 patients without patellofemoral pain, seven with, and found some interesting um, differences between the muscle activation patterns. Um, they found in the patellofemoral pain group, there was earlier deactivation of that vastus medialis obliquus. So um, in the cycle, in the pedal cycle, uh, this is, um, I apologize that it's not larger, but um, you do have access to all the slides. So, uh, but the vastus medialis um, begins at the same point at both, um, but in the patellofemoral pain group, um, it stops earlier and the vastus lateralis continues. Um, they also found that the biceps femoris contraction um, started earlier in that patellofemoral pain group, and they had decreased activation of the semitendinosus, another um, part of the hamstrings. And uh, th in this study, they can't say if the, um, the pain is caused by these um, differences in muscle activation. Uh, this may be a response to these patients dealing with this pain. Uh, they're adapting to it and uh, trying to brace the knee through this, but um, it's certainly an interesting difference between these groups and kind of highlights the um, importance of these um, various muscles about the knee in um, maintaining a pain-free pedal cycle. Um, so um, bicycle fit factors contributing to patellofemoral syndrome. Um, so a low seat position, um, if um, you see somebody looking like either of these two pictures, um, certainly uh, problematic. And um, if uh, somebody is dealing with patellofemoral uh, pain, would adjust the knee so um, the knee is more extended with the pedal at 6 o'clock. Uh, I think, you know, from those earlier uh, FIT studies, uh, probably aiming for 25 degrees, um, if um, somebody's dealing with this, so may raise that just a bit higher to um, decrease those compressive forces across the patella. Um, it's also important to look at the foot position on the pedal. Um, if the foot is pronated, uh, kind of turned in, again, you're increasing that lateral directed force on the patella. Um, and so it can adjust it so the hind foot is uh, more in a neutral position. Uh, and then also uh, overly high resistance um, can contribute to those increased compressive loads at the patellofemoral joint. Um, so we'd recommend low resistance training, uh, maintaining about 80 to 90 RPM cadence, and then also avoidance of hills while recovering. Um, additional um, other strategies to treat patellofemoral syndrome, so uh, quadriceps strengthening we think is key uh, with um, special focus on uh, strengthening of the VMO. And then stretching quads, hamstrings, uh, the gastroc soleus complex, the calf musculature, uh, patellofemoral bracing, um, or this is a demonstration of McConnell taping uh, where you're just um, taping that knee more towards the inside to keep it tracking centrally in the groove uh, can be beneficial. And then if uh, it seems like the problem's more from the foot, uh, can try orthotics there to adjust that uh, foot pronation. Uh, so another common um, overuse issue is patellar tendonitis. Um, so the patellar tendon connects the patella to the tibial tubercle, lets us extend the, knee, the leg, um, and repetitive microtrauma at that tendon with insufficient time uh, to allow for normal healing results in patellar tendonitis. Uh, this is something we also see in basketball players, just repetitive jumping. Um, any repetitive um, flexion extension of the knee is um, susceptible to this. Uh, it presents as pain at the front of the knee um, along the patellar tendon. So here we're looking at uh, an MRI slice of um, the knee, uh, looking at it from the side, have the femur at the top, uh, the tibia, this is the fibula in the back, this is the front of the knee in the back, this is the kneecap, the patella, and the quadriceps tendon coming here, and this is the patellar tendon. And this bright white here is just uh, inflammation, um, just fluid, um, that's indicating this area of injury at the, uh, where that patellar tendon um, originates from the distal pole of the patella. Um, the treatment for this, uh, really stretching the quadriceps, hamstrings, um, the iliotibial band, um, ice, anti-inflammatories, and with strengthening, it's really eccentric strengthening of the quadriceps that's shown to make the biggest difference. So that's doing squats on a slide board, um, and then reducing training intensity until the symptoms resolve. Um, there's also some recent interest in like, platelet-rich plasma, biologic injections. Um, this is an area where um, you're, it's overly inflamed, and then an abnormal healing response, trying to um, add something to 
sort of revamp the healing process. Um, the studies there are very mixed. Um, I'd say it's still experimental for this indication, but uh, may be considered. And um, this is one of the few overuse injuries that will occasionally consider surgical treatment, um, which is just clearing out that inflammatory tissue and then possibly repairing um, um, residual tendon back if needed. Um, Pez anserine bursitis. Um, so uh, the Pez um, is the insertion of three tendons on the medial aspect of the tibia. Um, and a bursa is just a fluid-filled sac, allows for gliding between tendon and bone. Uh, repetitive gliding, you can have um, inflammation of that area, and just presents with pain over the um, inside part of the proximal tibia. Um, this, we recommend treatment with hamstring stretching, oral anti-inflammatories, topical anti-inflammatories are often good, and then occasionally we'll inject just into that bursa to um, decrease that inflammatory response. Um, here, see just a demonstration of um, hamstring stretching to treat that problem. Um, moving um, to the outside of the knee, so iliotibial band syndrome is um, also quite common. Uh, this is something we also see in runners, but uh, frequently in cyclists also. Um, the iliotibial band is just a thick fascial um, band that runs from the hip uh, to the outside part of the knee. Um, it crosses over the um, lateral femoral condyle, just the bump on the um, end of the femur, and then inserts on the uh, top of the tibia. Um, and what happens is as you flex and extend the knee, this just glides back and forth over that bone. Um, and so a higher seat position um, results in greater knee extension may provoke this more, just that repetitive um, back and forth motion um, irritating this structure. Uh, also an increased cadence um, causes more friction in that area. And then tightness in the iliotibial band, uh, the gluteal muscles or the tensor fascia lata can contribute. Uh, for this, uh, we uh, recommend treating with higher resistance and then lower cadence, so decreasing the RPMs um, to limit the number of times that's sliding back and forth. Uh, lowering the seat height, uh, so going in the reverse direction, uh, can be beneficial here. Um, stretching of the IT band and foam rolling are um, other important treatments. Um, up towards the hip, um, the um, iliotibial band, um, it's um, over the lateral aspect of the, um, the femur. And uh, you can develop a trochanteric bursitis. Um, and again, that bursal, um, that sac of fluid uh, allows for normal gliding. And just um, repetitive gliding over that area can cause um, inflammation. Uh, treat similar stretches, ice anti-inflammatories. And um, that's a great area for a corticosteroid injection, uh, local treatment that often resolves the problem. Um, one other issue in the hip is um, iliopsoas tendonitis. Um, so the psoas muscle um, originates at the lumbar spine, the lower part of the spine, and then travels down to the top part of the femur. Um, and this is one of the primary hip flexors. Um, and tightness, um, because it's coming from the back, going down to the, the hips, uh, can actually contribute to low back pain and core issues also, um, crossing multiple important areas through there. Uh, this can often manifest as hip or groin pain. Um, and then treat this with uh, lowering the seat, stretching the hip flexors, and especially um, focusing on core strengthening. Um, down towards um, the ankle, um, Achilles tendonitis, um, a common problem, I think, for many. Uh, so pain at the posterior aspect, the back, um, just on the Achilles tendon. Um, this um, can often be worsened or caused by a low seat position. Um, so that knee flexion um, limits the ability of um, specifically the gastroc muscle. So um, the calf muscle is comprised of two um, primary muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus. Uh, the gastrocnemius actually starts above the knee joint, and the soleus starts just on the, um, on the leg below the knee joint. Um, and so a knee flexion limits that ability of the gastroc to contribute to calf power while pedaling. So um, raising the seat in this condition can take some of that stress off of the Achilles tendon. Um, the foot may be positioned um, too far posterior. Uh, so moving the foot forward um, can limit motion across the ankle, limit stress at the Achilles tendon. And then stretching the gastrocnemius and soleus, very important, probably the best treatment for this. So uh, correcting or adjusting those fit issues, um, eccentrically strengthening um, the Achilles tendon, and then um, rest reduction and training. Uh, so next, um, move into the lumbar spine. And uh, this is important in cyclists, 30% uh, prevalence over a one-year period between men and women in California. And 70% uh, of that, or 75%, was due to low back pain. Um, and bicycle fit, again, can contribute to malalignment of the spine. Um, a long top tube um, have extended lordotic um, lumbar posture. That's 
Uh, the lordosis is the normal curve we have in the lower spine, but you accentuate that uh, with um, reaching over um, with that long tube. And then uh, low handlebars also exaggerate that um, posture. And uh, with the spine, there are multiple small muscles that contribute to stabilization. So um, ensuring that all of these are appropriately strong, appropriately coordinated um, to perform the, the complex task um, is very important. Um, so a few studies that have looked at um, spine issues in cycling. One, um, Burnett looked at um, spine kinematics and trunk muscle activity in cyclists with and without low back pain. Um, and so they um, had people cycle preferred position and then hooked them up to monitors to um, evaluate um, muscle activity. And then um, they found that the cyclists with pain, um, they had um, increased lower lumbar flexion, so more of that lordosis posture. And then um, I think really importantly, loss of co-contraction of the lower lumbar multifidus muscle. Um, so what they found was that these people weren't quite able to stabilize their spine efficiently um, because that multifidus muscle wasn't doing its job. So uh, this may be inadequate core low back strength that's um, possibly resulting in pain. Again, um, can't quite say it's causative. It may be reactionary, but an important thing to focus on if dealing with this problem. Um, it, this um, was a review paper on um, multiple studies looking at body positioning, muscle activity, spine kinematics, um, again, in cyclists with and without low back pain. And uh, what they found across um, a number of different studies was um, subjects with low back pain um, showed fatigue in their arm muscles and uh, postural spinal, spine musculature. Um, they actually had reduced abdominal and back muscle thickness, both at rest and during contraction, so um, smaller muscles, uh, less active during contraction, and then greater lumbopelvic flexion. So again, that more lordotic posture. Um, so these are um, cyclists that are likely relying more on their arms, less on their core strength, uh, and then having fatigue earlier due to weakness in their core musculature. Um, and again, can't say it's causing the low back pain, but it's likely a large component of it. Uh, and then uh, they did find one study that uh, reported positive results with biofeedback training. So uh, giving them some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, to adjust their position, uh, that actually improved their pain. Um, another interesting study, um, Salai looked at uh, the effects of changing the saddle angle um, in recreational cyclists. So uh, they took 40 cyclists uh, with low back pain, and they lowered the tip of the saddle 10 to 15 degrees from um, the horizontal in that group with low back pain. And um, after, I think it was six weeks, um, after a prolonged period of cycling with this, uh, they asked them again how their pain was. 72% reported resolution of their back pain. 20% uh, had a major reduction um, in the occurrence and the magnitude. 7% said no difference. Um, but as you can see in the diagram here, just that simple change of the saddle um, tip um, and that angle there may change that uh, posture of the lumbar spine. Um, so this is certainly a, um, an easy thing to do for somebody dealing with low back pain and may make a large difference. So uh, for treatment recommendations for low back pain, um, I think the, the biggest is um, core strengthening exercises. Um, and one of my friends who's an um, avid cycler um, said you know, that cycling relies on core strengthening, or core strength, but it doesn't build it. And so uh, this is something that you know, cyclists need to focus on um, and really dedicate to, uh, to strengthening because it's not gonna come just from time on the bike. Um, biofeedback training, um, if possible, um, has been shown to be beneficial in um, altering the position of the spine and the pelvis. And then um, I think considering that um, uh, changing the saddle tilt is also beneficial. Um, for neck and shoulder pain, um, so um, as we saw, the professional cyclists reported this less commonly, but recreational cyclists, this is a, uh, seems to be a large issue. And um, in uh, one epidemiological study, 66% um, of riders had mild neck and shoulder injury, and 20% uh, reported uh, being really uncomfortable or had to change their riding style or stop. And um, at the end of a tour type event, neck and shoulder problems are more common. So um, this seems to be something uh, accelerated by overuse, do more cycling. And um, this is often caused by uh, trying to assume a more horizontal position. So with more trunk flexion, uh, the cyclist is more aerodynamic, um, but um, to uh, maintain a horizontal gaze, keep your eyes on the road, you need to hyperextend the neck, which leads to pain. 
Um, this can be treated with um, fit adjustments, so raising the handlebars, shortening the reach, as well as stretching for the neck, the thoracic spine, paraspinal muscles of the cervical spine. Um, so uh, the final group of injuries to touch on is just nerve compression. Um, so a few common nerve compression sites. One is the hand. Um, so the ulnar nerve and the median nerve are uh, two common culprits. The median nerve um, crosses the wrist through the carpal tunnel. Um, it's on the palmar side of your hand. Um, and the, uh, um, the ulnar nerve um, is through Guillain's canal, which is um, out towards the pinky finger side of the hand. Um, the foot is also a common site of nerve compression injuries in cyclists, um, especially the lateral branch of the deep perineal nerve, uh, which is innervating the top of the foot. Um, and with both, this is um, holding the handlebars too long or in certain positions, um, straps on the feet, um, shoes overly tight, um, and would recommend treatment with padded gloves, adjusting the hand position, and addressing shoe fit. So um, in these last um, two slides, uh, just discuss um, prevention. Um, so I, I think one uh, very important factor for um, anyone um, who's um, maybe beginning cycling, dealing with an overuse injury is a good evaluation of bicycle fit. Um, there aren't um, perfect parameters, but um, I think when you're recovering from anything, dealing with an overuse injury, uh, varying the fit can contribute to um, overcoming that injury. Um, I think cross-training and maintenance of strength during the off-season are um, vital uh, factors. So cycling, again, relies on core strength, doesn't build it, and stretching and flexibility are key. Um, we have our sportsrehab.ucsf.edu has some great um, videos and handouts on certain exercises that can be done, um, but this uh, flexibility and stretching is very important. Um, it's also something to think about with, um, you know, most of us sitting during the day, get on a bicycle, you're sitting again, um, you're never really stretching um, your lower body, so possibly um, standing more during the day and just maintaining that flexibility. Gradually increasing uh, training duration and intensity when returning to cycling, starting at the beginning of a year. Um, and um, also I think an important factor that may be overlooked often is uh, complete rehabilitation after traumatic injuries. Uh, I think often, many times people are rushing back uh, to get back on the bike, uh, but then may uh, make adjustments due to a lingering injury, whether it's uh, collarbone fracture that they had plated, if it's a, a hip injury, a wrist injury, and then they're shifting their mechanics and then creating um, problematic scenarios that then perpetrate these overuse injuries. Uh, so in conclusion, um, overuse injuries, uh, they're unfortunately common in cycling, uh, but uh, treatment and prevention strategies often involve um, evaluation of bike fit, adjustments for a specific cyclist anatomy, and uh, an appropriate training regimen.